All right. How many of you guys are enjoying um, being Bible nerds with us? <laughs> Because like, I don't know about you, but like Pastor Gary and I, we love being Bible nerds. So for us, like for me, this is really enjoyable going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through things. Because I don't know about you, but I think it's cool to be a Bible nerd. I'm just saying, like, if you don't think it's cool to study the Bible, and if you're not a nerd for the Bible, I would ask you, what are you a nerd for? Because here's the thing, we all are passionate about something, and why not, why not have it be God's word, amen? All right, so today we are in Ephesians chapter two, and it's my intention to get through this entire chapter. We'll kind of see how that goes, all right? Because this is easily, if you've, if you've read this chapter, probably you have read this chapter if you're doing the 260 journey, this is easily one of those chapters that's filled with so much truth and so much spiritual insight that you could spend probably weeks, like tearing this message apart, tearing these, these verses apart, going verse by verse through these. But with that being said, I'm gonna try to get through all of this chapter, all this chapter today. And if you're a note taker, I entitled today's message, Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking, right? And so, as I preach tonight, and as I was preparing for tonight to preach, and as I was reading through the book of Ephesians, as I was reading through chapter two, today I spent like all day studying for this message. That phrase just kept coming to my mind, dead man walking. And most of you guys know that I was a dead man walking. Can you put that picture up? So most of you guys know my story, but that was me 11 years ago. Like, how, how many of you guys have heard the term dead man walking before? Right, probably all of us, right? And what, what that term refers to is somebody that is on death row, they're getting ready to be executed. Before they're executed, they are called dead man walking. Even though they're physically alive, they're facing certain death, and that was me. I was in a prison of my own making, and even though I was alive, I was sentenced to death. Right? If it was up to the devil... That guy right there would be dead. And not in the way of dead to Christ, dead in Christ and resurrected in Christ, but dead, dead. Right? Because drugs and alcohol were my everything, right? The devil wanted me to go to an early grave. Because remember, the devil comes to do what? Kill, steal, and destroy. He wants us to be the living dead. He wants us to live dead. And I say all that to say this, there is hope in Jesus. I am proof, I am living proof that there is hope in Jesus. And you don't have to be zombies. You don't have to be the living dead. We can have real lives. Did you know that? That's exciting to me. So Ephesians chapter one, it left, we, we left Ephesians chapter one and hopefully, as you went through Ephesians chapter one, as we studied Ephesians chapter one together, your eyes were open to see that we are treasured by God. Think about that. Think about it. We are treasured by God, right? We got to see his power to raise people from the dead, to raise Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter one talks about our redemption, right? The redemption we have in Christ. Remember I said the, the word in Christ or in him or in Jesus is a very important phrase that's in Ephesians, particularly Ephesians chapter one, two, and three, because everything is about being in him, right? Ephesians chapter one talks about what God did for us, right? He gave us this amazing gift, what? Salvation. Right? And then last week, Pastor Gary wrapped up Ephesians chapter one and, the, and he wrapped it up uh, talking about Paul's prayer. So Paul's prayer was beautiful, it was powerful, but now we're moving into Ephesians chapter two and it's, it's as if Paul is saying, hey, let's go back to what we started off with when we were talking in Ephesians chapter one. Let me go back to what we began talking about. Right? And that idea is simply this. Let's talk about the great things that God has done for us. Let's talk about the great things that God has done for us. 
How many of you guys like talking about the goodness of God? <laughs> like I never get tired of sharing my testimony. You know why? Because it shows the goodness of God. And, and pastor told a, a story at the end of the sermon this last Sunday of a man who God did a miraculous thing in his life and his mentor told him, once, your sto- once everyone has heard your story, your ministry's over. And you know what? The devil tries to get me to believe that all the time. But you know what never expires? Our testimony. Because our testimony shows the goodness of our God. Don't let the devil steal your testimony. Okay? So that's kind of the structure that we find in the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters of Ephesians, it talks virtually nothing about what we are to do for Christ. The first three chapters talks about what God has done for us, what God has done for you. That's pretty great, right? And the greatest thing that God has ever done for us is that he gave us life in Christ, right? And I don't know about you, hopefully since you're a believer, but for me, like I rejoice in the fact that in Christ I have been raised from the dead, right? Like I am a resurrected man in Christ. However, the world doesn't seem to realize that they need to be raised from the dead, right? Because they don't believe what? They don't believe that they're dead, Right? And you could argue that most of the people on the face of this earth, they are spiritually dead even though they're physically walking. Right? There's so many living dead. There's so many people that are zombies and they don't even know it. They are dead men. They are dead women walking. And here's the thing. We were all dead before we came to Christ. Right? We were dead and we did, probably didn't even know it. So, In Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, it really focuses on our new life in Christ. And if you look at those, just those 10 verses, it really gives us a summary of the entire gospel message. It's very similar to what Paul actually wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter three. He wrote a very similar message. However, in Ephesians, it emphasizes something that Romans doesn't. Ephesians emphasizes our participation with Christ, our union with Christ, because we are, I'm gonna say it again, in Christ, right? So the beginning of this chapter starts with the desperate situation that humanity faces. Let's pray before we get into reading the word of God. Heavenly Father, I have a very simple prayer tonight, Lord Jesus. Speak to us through your holy scriptures. Speak to us through your word, Lord God. Allow us to leave here, Lord God, enlightened by the words of your voice, Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that it wouldn't be I that speaks, but it would be you that speaks through me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So hopefully you have your Bibles with you. Open up to Ephesians chapter two if you already haven't. And we are gonna be starting off reading verses one and two. Ephesians chapter two, verses one and two. He says this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That is a, like that's a very powerful way to start off a chapter, okay? And it's, a, it's an important reality check, okay? Because to truly understand who you are in Christ, you need to recognize who you were without him. Right? And without Jesus, we were dead. And a lot of times when I meet somebody, I like to ask them a question. I like to ask lots of questions. Okay? I'm like a very inquisitive person. But one of the questions I often ask people is this How long have you been a Christian? I don't know, like, it just intrigues me to figure out how long people have been Christian, Christians. And when I moved to Texas, I can't tell you how many people told me that I've been a Christian. My whole life, my entire life, right? Like, you know that saying, like, if I had a quarter every time somebody said this, you would be rich? Like, if I had a quarter every time somebody told me, I cut my teeth in the pews, right? You know what that that tells me? You've been in church for a while because churches don't even have pews anymore, okay? I cut my church, I cut my teeth in in the pews. I've been a Christian my whole life. But here's the thing. There's not a single person 
on the face of this earth who has been a Christian their whole entire lives. You guys realize that, right? There comes a point in everyone's life that they have to accept the free gift of God. Even if you've been raised in church your whole life, right? You were dead until the day that you accepted Jesus into your life. Spiritually speaking, everybody is born into this earth dead, right? So after describing this wonderful display of God's power to raise Christ from the dead at the end of chapter one, Paul begins chapter two, the next section describing our pre-Christian status. And our pre-Christian status is dead, right? It's dead. We come into this world spiritually dead because we are descendants of Adam and Eve, right? So the world doesn't like to hear that, right? Like if you would have talked to me pre-Jesus and you would have said, hey, you're dead and you need Jesus, you know what I would have said to you? First, you're crazy. Second, I'm not dead. I am very much alive. I would have been like, I just wouldn't have got what you're, what you're trying to put down, right? But here's the thing I, I had to come to realize in life as I matured and as I grew in my faith. There's a lot of different kinds of ways to be alive, right? Someone might be very alive in one sense, but dead in another. Have you ever thought that? The same is true with death, right? The Bible, in the Bible, there's more than one kind of death, right? And in this verse, it said, you are dead in your transgressions. You are dead in your sins because of the way that you used to live. And so the word dead here, um, it means something interesting. It, it, for the Greek word dead, which is what this passage was originally written in, it doesn't mean physical death, right? I'm sure we all know that. What it means is a separation from the one who gives life. Right? So if you want to define death, the way I would define death is that death equals separation. Death equals separation. Think about it. When you're physically dead, it's a separation of the person from what? The body. Right? And, and I already alluded to this, but in verse 1, a spiritual, this is about a spiritual death, right? So it's a separation of us from God. Right? And a spiritual, being spiritually dead doesn't mean that you're physically dead. It doesn't mean that you're socially dead. It doesn't mean that you're psychologically or emotionally dead. Right? But you could say, <laughs> you could say that the most vital part of a human, the spirit, is dead to the most important factor of life, God. Think about that. The most vital part of us as a human being, our spirit, is dead from the most important factor and life, which is God, right? You were dead. You were separated from God because of your sins and your transgressions. And Paul sums the plight of sin up in Romans chapter six, right? I think pastor talked about it this weekend. The wages of sin is death, but not obviously physical death, eternal separation from God, right? There's a, if you've been in any of my classes, I've said this before, but there's a lot of ways to describe hell, Right, And we often think when we talk about hell, we often think of fire and gnashing of teeth. That's like the common way to think, right? That's what Hollywood makes us think, right? But do you want to know what hell really looks like? It's eternal separation from God, right? If God is light and you are eternally separated from God, what does hell look like? Not darkness, eternal darkness, Right? And that's really what the, how the Bible describes it. Nahum calls hell the realm of darkness. Matthew call, says that we will be thrown into the darkness. Jude says it's the blackest of darkness. Revelation says that we will be plunged into darkness. And all of that will happen for eternity. Because of your sins. Because of my sins. We end up separated from God and the blackest of darkness. Right? And that's what Romans 6 teaches us. The wage of sin is death. And that is a very real experience because in God's eyes, we were dead and we were subject to his wrath, right? But the cool thing about Romans 6, that verse in Romans 6, is it's like a coin, right? Every coin has what? Two sides. And so does this verse, right? The wage of sin is death. A wage is something that has to be paid, right? If you worked this week, you expect to get a week's 
wage, right? And so a wage is something that has to be paid. So the wage of sin is death, and it has to be paid by your death. Or on the flip side of that coin, right? On the flip side of that coin, it can be paid for by whose death? Jesus Christ, right? The wage of sin is death. The question is, who is gonna foot the bill? You or him? Right? Like I remember when I was a, a broke 20 some year old, maybe some of you guys can still relate to this. If I would go out to eat with somebody and they said, hey, let me take care of that bill. You know what I would let them do? I would let them pay for it. Like I'm no sucker here, okay? Go for it, here you go, right? But here's the cool thing. Jesus wants to pay the bill, right? So as we dig into the rest of this passage, scholars call this section, The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil is the power of sin that keeps us in bondage, and that bondage is what keeps us away from God, right? So verse two says, you were dead when you followed the ways of this world. You were dead when you followed the ways of this world. And this isn't hard to understand, right? Think about it. Look at the world around us. Everything in the world around us, guess what it does? It draws us away from God, right? The world around us, the world wants us to put something on on the throne of our hearts that doesn't belong there. And as Christians, we have to guard our hearts. We we have to be careful of, of what we place on the throne of our hearts, amen? And it's not like you can just place God on the throne of your heart and walk away for a month and think that he's still gonna be there. Because the world will do everything that they can to take that throne off, to take that off and to put something else on the throne without you even knowing it. Because the devil wants you to be the living dead. So the world and its external influences gives us a way of life that takes us down a path that separates us from God and his values. I mean, think about it. The world says, I'm king. God says what? No, I'm the king, right? The world says, put yourself first. God says, be a servant. The world looks at the external, right? Youth and beauty and money and position. You have a winning personality. God says, I look at the heart. I look at the inside, not the outside, right? The world says, befriend people who you can use to climb the social ladder. Don't hang around losers, God says, treat everyone equal because we are all created in God's image, right? The world says, seek vengeance. God says, seek forgiveness, right? These are just like a few examples. You could, I could, the list could go on and on and on and on, right? But here's the thing. There, these views don't just differ. Like the world's views and God's views, they don't just differ. They are opposite, They are totally opposite. And what's interesting is when Paul wrote this letter, the people that he was writing this letter to, guess what? (laughs) They were having the exact same issues. They were living for the world, just like so many people do today. In fact, not just worldly people, Christian people. Again, we have to be careful what is on the throne of our hearts. We have to be willing to examine our hearts. We can't just check off the boxes and be like, well, I go to church on Wednesday, I go on Sunday, I'm on the prayer team, I give, right? It has to be more than that, right? So Paul goes on in verse two then to describe the devil, and he says, the devil is the ruler of the air. He is the one, he is the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. And it's interesting how Paul describes the devil here. He says, he's the one who is in work and those who are disobedient. But guess what? You don't work for the devil anymore. Did you know that? Like, how many of you guys have had a job and you just had a horrible boss, right? And you left that job and you went and you, had, you got your next job, you had a great boss, right? If your previous boss called you up and is like, hey, William, I need you to work this weekend. What would you tell them? I don't work for you anymore. I got a good boss, Right? And so Paul reminds us, he goes on to remind us in in verse three that we all used to work for this horrible boss, and his name was Satan. His name was the devil. So, verse three, it says this 
All of us used to live among those, them at one time. All of us used to have that guy as the boss, is what he's saying, right? Um, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following the des our desires and our thoughts, like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. In some translations, your translations probably said that we were what? Children of wrath, right? So before God, we were children of wrath, but now we have a new, a new life in Christ. So before Christ, we worked to please the flesh. We worked for Satan. We danced Satan's little tune, right? And we were deserving of wrath because of our heritage, right? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I, I, I just want what I deserve, Right? Like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm a good Christian. Like I said, I come to church on Wednesdays. I come to church on Sundays. I pray for other people. I give. I do all of these things, and I'm not getting blessed. This joker over here, he goes to church once a month, and guess what God's doing for him? Blessing this guy. Like, have you ever thought, like, man, like, why, why isn't this happening to me? Well, guess what? That's a bad idea. Because as hard as you work, you still deserve the wrath of God. Because the Bible teaches us that we have all sinned and fallen what? Short of the glory of God. Now here's the thing. Some people don't like the fact that we inherit a sinful nature, thus inheriting the wrath of God. But this is what I say. We all need to gang up together when we get to heaven. And we need to go knock in the mansion door of Adam and Eve. And be like, you messed this all up for us. You had it right, like you had it perfect, and then you had to do that because we could have all lived in paradise this whole time, right? But, but because of them, we inherited a sinful nature. Now, wouldn't it be terrible if the book of Ephesians ended in verse three? You guys all deserve wrath. <laughs> it would be bad, okay? But guess what? It doesn't end there. And so the next section starts with one of my favorite phrases, but God, but God, because here's the thing. I was a dead man walking, right? And my addiction, everyone had counted my life as a loss, but God, verse four and five, but God is so rich in his mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. We were in big trouble, but God. Now, you want to know why God sent his own son down here to die? It tells us in this verse, because he is rich in mercy and because he loves us so much. I love this verse because this verse is where I was when I met Jesus. Right? And maybe some of you guys are, were in the same place, right? That God saved you when you were dead in your sin. When you were in the middle of your sin and you were sinning against God, God loved you so much, he saved you, and that's grace, right? A gift that we all, none of us deserve, right? In fact, for myself personally, I was, I, I, when, when God saved me, when God radically rescued me, I wasn't even thinking of God, Right? I wasn't pursuing God because I was literally in the middle of my mess. But then God radically rescued me. Right? And, and you guys, have, most of you have heard my story, right? But when God radically rescued me, in one hour I got three public intoxications, three disorderly conducts, one open container. My life was falling apart. I had been addicted to drugs and alcohol for over 10 years. But God. Right? But God. And I, I say that to say this, everyone has hope, right? Never give up on hope, right? Because here's the thing, I think everybody can experience a but God moment. I mean, in, in the first chapter, it said that God predestined us. And so I believe that everyone is predestined to have a but God moment. Don't underestimate the power of your prayers, I'll tell you that because I'm standing here today because of the prayers of my grandma. Amen. Moving on to the passage, verses six through 10. He says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order 
that in the coming age he might show his riches, the riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not, or this is, this is not for yourself. It is a gift from God, not by works so that anyone can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. And what I like about this section here is that there's this threefold use of the word with. Okay, we are alive with Christ. We are raised with Christ. We are seated with Christ, right? So what is said to be true about Jesus, guess what, is now true about us, as long as you are what? With Christ, right? So we can closely identify in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, right? And so God raised us all the way up to heaven. He seated us with him. And you want to know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus? That's what it means, right? Because if you're a clever Christian, like if you're up with the times and somebody asks you, hey, what is all this Christianity stuff about? You're probably going to say something like this. It's not about religion. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's a correct answer, Okay, but I think when most people hear this, they limit it to like, hey, now I can interact with Jesus, right? If I have a personal relationship with Jesus, now I can talk to him and what? He can talk to me. I can pray to him. However, there's more to it than just that. There is an objective side to having a personal relationship with Jesus. And don't miss it because it's fundamental to everything else. Because you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you can now identify with Christ in his death, his resurrection, and his enthronement. Right? Because we need to keep in the back of our minds that, that threefold source of bondage, that, that threefold source of sin that we talked about, the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? We are redeemed from that because of our relationship with Christ, right? That meaning that we no longer have to pay the penalty or the wages of sin for those three things. However, the world, the flesh, and the devil, guess what? They still exist. They're still going to tempt you. But because you have a relationship with Jesus, you can now identify with Christ in his death, his resurrection, and his enthronement. And you, too, can have power to overcome the enemy. Praise God. Praise God, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, God said that he chose you before the creation of the world to be what? Holy and blameless. Did you know that you are called to be holy and blameless? Well, guess what? <laughs> you can now do that. Because you are not stuck as a result of your past sins, right? Right? But you can also have future and your you can also have victory in your future because of your relationship with Christ, because you can identify with his death, his resurrection, and his enthronement. And here's the thing: for everyone out there, I'm gonna keep saying this. You don't have to, to, to live that dead life anymore. You don't have to live that dead life anymore. There is hope. Like when I was in my mess, I thought my life was hopeless, right? But God redeemed me in my sin, right? God redeemed me in my sin. Now, all of this has a purpose that's bigger than yourself, than you and I, okay? And this is obviously for us, but it's bigger than us because God is trying to accomplish something amazing here. So verse seven tells us, that God seated us with him in heaven in order that in the coming ages or in the future, right, that he might show the riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. <laughs> that is a mouthful, but you want to know what it means? That God is going to show future generations his character through you. He's going to say, look at what I did in William's life right? Look at what I did in this person's life. And guess what? God is not a respecter of persons. If he can do it in my life, he can do it in anybody's life because that's the kind of God that we serve, right? But there's also another unique glimpse uh, of the God that we serve now that we are living in Christ. And we may not always catch this, but it says that God is kind, right? Like we know that God is love, 
We hear that a lot. We know that God is merciful, but now we get to see that God is kind. And what's interesting is this idea is really found all over the Bible, right? First Corinthians chapter 13 is one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, right? And what does first Corinthians chapter 13 talk about? Love, right? The subject of it is love. Most people consider this Paul, um, Paul's, one of Paul's greatest literature writings. But in that chapter in verse four, it says, love is kind. But we also know that according to 1 John chapter four, that God is love. So if love is kind and God is love, what does that make God? Kind, right? Romans two teaches us that God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. Romans 11 teaches us that God's kindness is there to lead us to salvation. And this verse tells us the ultimate expression of God's love is to show us his grace in Christ Jesus. Now here's the thing that I've learned. No one can be loving, I mean genuinely loving, okay, and be unkind at the same time. <laughs> I mean you may have people that act loving, right, act loving, and they may be unkind, but you know what those people are? Those people are dead in their trespasses and sins, okay? Genuine love, when you have genuine love, it's very hard to be unkind. So now we get to the famous verses. Did you know that some verses in scripture are famous? Like they have Instagram followers, Twitter followers, and you think I'm joking, but I'm not, there are literally famous scriptures, and here's two of them. Verse eight and verse nine. It said, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It, this is not from yourself. It is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. How many of you guys have heard that verse? How many of you guys have memorized that verse? Probably a lot of you. It's a very famous verse, right? Salvation by grace through faith. Right, It's our gift from God. And the result of that is there's nothing that we can do to earn it. However, when Paul was writing this to the church of Ephesus, people might have thought that they could have worked hard enough to earn merit from God. And the reason I say that, if you remember, in week one, I told you the city of Ephesus was known for its religious cults. There was a lot of religious cults, right? And two of the cults had deities and they were called holy and just, okay? And in the temples of these deities, one of the temple gods, statue of it, was holding a measuring rod, and, <clears throat> and the other deity was holding a scale, right? And what it signified was that the people of these cults, they needed to earn merit for, from God to be able to get to heaven, all right? And I, again, these are cults, okay? But this is in the area of the Ephesus church, right? And some of these people would have come to know Jesus Christ, so they would have carried that baggage with them. But here's the thing. I think that that's a common view today, right? How many of you guys heard people, anyone say like, I'm a good person. I don't need Christ. I'm a good person. Or I've heard people say, well, like, if your God is so loving, why would he send a good person to hell, right? What they're basically saying is, I can earn my ticket to heaven, I can earn my ticket to heaven. And my response to that is this. God doesn't send anyone to hell. All right? The kingdom that you worship here on earth is gonna be the kingdom that you inherit for eternity. Right? The, our actions send us to hell, not God. Right? He is a just God, right? And there has to be consequences for sin. But he's also a loving God. And he's made a way of escape. Right? And that's what Ephesians is talking about. That way of escape. Right? So Paul tells us that there isn't any amount of works that we, that we can do to tip the scales to our side. And I hate to say this, I really hate to say this, but there's going to be some good people in hell. And that's why we need to share Jesus. Did you hear what I said? That's why we need to share Jesus, because I would hate for a good person not to make it to heaven because I didn't do something about it. Obviously, it has to be the Holy Spirit working inside of them, right? But I have a part to play in that, and so do you, right? We need to share Jesus, right? Think about this. I, asked, I, I, I taught a class last night, and I asked the class this. How would your life change if you thought of yourself as a missionary? 
Right? How would your life change if you thought of your life as a, as a missionary? Like, I'm going to work today, and I'm a missionary. I'm going into Aldi's today, and I'm a missionary. I'm going to the gas station today, I'm a missionary. Would that change the way that you lived? I certainly hope it would, right? Here's the thing. Paul talks about this very similar thing to the Galatians church and to the Romans church. However, he adds a word when he talks to the Galatians and to the Romans. He says that they can't earn their way to salvation by the works of the law, right? Basically saying like, look, you can't gain your way up there by just obeying every single law. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't mention the word law here. And the reason why I think is because he wants to go beyond just the law. Right? And also in verse 11, it tells us that it says, remember, you were formerly Gentiles. Right? So the Jews thought that they could earn their way to heaven by works of the law. But guess what? The Gentiles, they didn't care about the Jewish law. Right? So here in Ephesians, Paul's basically saying no works of any kind in any context can give you enough credits to earn your way to heaven. Right? What Paul's doing here is very important. What Paul's doing here is he's shifting the focus, right? From ourselves to God, right? We can never be good enough. We are only good in Christ, right? And here's the thing. If people could earn their salvation, if you could work for your salvation, then you could boast, then you could brag, then you could walk around with an arrogant swagger and be like, I did it. I earned enough credits to make it to heaven, all right? And you know what would eventually happen? Christians, they would look down on the unsaved people and they would be self-righteous. Like, I'm disciplined enough to follow the law, so you're just a mess. All right? But here's the thing. God hates boasting. If, if Christianity makes you arrogant in any way, you're doing it all wrong because it's completely by grace. From the beginning to the end. It's by grace. Worship team, if you want to come up, we'll wrap up with this verse, verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God pre prepared for us in advance to do. And the word handiwork here, in your Bible, it might say masterpiece. And the Greek, it means poem. It is a work of art. God is an artist and he expresses himself. He tells his story through his art. Us. Isn't that like, that's pretty cool, right? That God expresses himself through us. And we are God's story of grace for what? Future generations to see. Like pastor talks about the hiding place quite often, right? That is, we are the future generation that gets to see the grace of God in her life. Amen? And how our lives are the exact same way. Right? So then Paul goes ahead and puts works into a proper perspective. Right? Because our lives shouldn't be, have a lack of good works. But we have to make sure that we don't put the cart in front of the horse. You understand what I'm saying? Like we... We, we, we have to put works in the right order. Paul tells us that we are to do good works, right, as a product of our salvation. We don't do good works to earn salvation. We do good works. Works is the fruit because we have a relationship with Christ, right? Not the other way around. So if you want to kind of basically sum up the entire first 10 verses, you can basically sum it up by looking at verse 13. It says this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we wrap up tonight's message, there are some great truths to ponder in Ephesians. We only made it through 10 verses, but like, I hope that you see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is this, that without Christ, we were dead men and women walking. But in Christ... You are born again, right? Christ can reach us even in the middle of our mess. Like, God isn't afraid to get a little dirty for you. <laughs> Don't you love that? That he will meet you right where you are. Amen? Stand with me, if you will. A 
Ephesians chapter two, to me, serves as this powerful reminder of how God can transform us by his grace. I mean, when I look at that picture that I post, that we put up earlier, I don't even recognize that person, right? Ephesians chapter two emphasizes that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled to God. Thank you, Jesus, right? What it means to be reconciled is that two things that were torn apart are brought back together and made whole. (laughs) And we are reconciled. We are whole when we are in Christ. We are brought into a new relationship with him, a a relationship with unity. God, God breaks those barriers between him and ourselves. Ephesians chapter two gives us a glimpse of God's amazing love, and it reminds us of the tremendous blessing and privilege that we have as members of his kingdom. Amen. If you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ and they are the walking dead and they are living dead, that's who I want us to pray for tonight. Take some time before we leave. I'm gonna close in prayer, but take some time before we leave and pray pray for that person. I know this, all of us have somebody in our lives who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Whether it's a loved one, a coworker, we all know somebody. And the second thing I really want you to think about this week is, how would my life change if everywhere I stepped, I thought of myself as a missionary for God? What would I do different? Who would I talk to? What would I share? And then I want you to earnestly pray, Lord, allow me to be a worker in your fields, right? We, we know the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But we got 150 workers in here right now. Amen. Go out and, and harvest the fields that are ready to be pulled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your words would sink deep in our hearts, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord God, for redeeming us, Lord God, for taking us out of our, out of our muck, Lord God, out of our miry clay, Lord God, pulling us out of that, Lord Jesus, giving us real life in you, Lord God. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be examples, Lord God, for your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, for all of those people in this room that have lost ones, lost loved ones, lost co-workers, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, for their souls. I pray that they would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to be missions mindset, Lord God. We don't have to go to a foreign country to be a missionary for you. We can be a missionary at our jobs, in our families, wherever we step foot, Lord God. Allow it to be another step forward for your kingdom, Lord God. Give us boldness. Give us courage, Lord God, that we have never, never, never had before. Open up opportunities for us to speak to people, Lord God, and put the words in our mouths, Lord God. Allow it to not be us that speaks, but Holy Spirit, you speaking through us. I pray, Lord God, that you would prepare the hearts, Lord God, of those we are going to speak to that you would till the soil of their hearts, Lord God, and that seed would be planted on fertile soil and grow deep roots and grow into a mighty, mighty harvest for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. I urge you to take some time, pray for those who don't know Jesus, amen. Thank you guys for coming. that